Okay. All right, and with that, welcome to uh, Tin Mountains Nature Program Series. I'm Nora Duflo, Tin Mountains Program Director, uh, and we're very excited for tonight's program. Um, before I hand things over to Steve, I do want to thank, take a moment um, and thank Tin Mountains Nature Program Series sponsors, and those are White Mountain Oil and Propane, Ragged Mountain Equipment, and Hancock Lumber. So we do appreciate their financial support that allows us to, um, to put on our programming. I also want to thank all of you watching who are current members of Tin Mountain Conservation Center. Your membership dollars also go towards helping us to fulfill our mission. Um, if you're not currently a Tin Mountain member and you would like information on, on becoming one, if you go to our website, tinmountain.org, in the upper right-hand corner, there is a support us tab where you can look at, learn more about membership information. There's also a tab up there just to donate directly to our nature program series if you want to help us continue um, to put on our public programs. Uh, and you know, speaking of public programs, uh, a few of our upcoming programs, as I mentioned, first season auction or benefit auction kicks off next Saturday, the 19th at 7 p.m. with a fun uh, little virtual live event. And then the auction will run um, that evening through uh, the following Saturday, uh, March 26th. Also on March 26th, we have signs of spring at Pondicherry Wildlife Refuge. Um, up in the Jefferson Whitefield area. That's an in-person field program. Uh, Dave Gavatsky will be leading a hike in there. Always a good time. Um, if you're interested in joining us or learning a little bit more about that program, you can head to our website um, where there's also a link to register. Um, and then on Thursday, March 31st, closing out the month of March, um, we are excited to have uh, Kathy Seymour um, of Mass Audubon um, will be presenting a program, a virtual evening program on Sawat owls. So um, a pretty fun species there. So lots of fun upcoming ways for you to interact with Tin Mountain. Um, but uh, I also want to, you know, want to uh, you know, hand things over to tonight's presenter. Um, before I do, just a few quick logistics. One, um, I think all of you are muted. Um, and uh, if you can please stay muted during the program so that we don't pick up any unintended background noise. Um, if you have a question, the best way to ask it is to type it directly into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. I'll be monitoring that chat. Um, and if it's an immediate clarifying question, I'm, um, I can pop in and ask it of Steve. Otherwise, we'll hold those questions till the end of the presentation, um, at which point I'll read through them. Um, and you're also welcome at that point. To, at that point. And, um, and ask questions directly of, uh, you know, of Steve as well. So that whew, is my song and dance. Um, and so we are excited, um, you know, we, uh, you know, as many of you know, Tin Mountain has a brook trout habitat restoration internship and project that we have been involved with for, um, gosh, I think we are approaching our 12th field season. Um, and through that project, we have connected with a lot of great groups, Trout Unlimited, um, as well as the North Country Angler. And our interns last summer were, were, were very enthusiastic about fly tying and um, hosted a program at Tin Mountain, which, um, which Steve came to um, and, and helped us to promote. And um, that was a great way of connecting. And we have been interested in, in putting a program together and so are glad that it came to fruition and thought that this is a perfect time. We're sort of approaching that cabin fever now that the snow is starting to melt. I think many of us, you know, wouldn't be sad to see it go and are, are looking ahead to, to spring. Um, so we're very excited to have Steve Angers of the North Country Angler 
um, presenting on fly fishing New Hampshire's secret waters. All right, so Steve, I'm gonna hand things over to you. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much, Nora. Thank you to all the Tin Mountain members that are here tonight. And um, I think you're probably here because you share a passion for um, brook trout and the beautiful envir environments that they live in. And uh, for years and years, um, New Hampshire wasn't really known as a go-to destination for brook trout. Uh, all the publicity went to Maine, but um, there are so many, so many good waters for brook trout in New Hampshire that, uh, that somebody needed to talk about it. And uh, we'll get into exactly how I ended up uh, talking about it. But um, since I caught my very first brook trout at the base of Champney Falls at the tender age of six, brook trout have been my passion. So uh, this is just an extenuation of that. And uh, let's, uh, let's move forward. I think Nora, I can just click and people will see it, right? Okay. So um, I put this in here because I wasn't sure if everybody that was participating is from New Hampshire. But uh, one of the things that's important to know about brook trout um, is that we are the granite state, which means that it a, has a good news story and a bad news story. The good news is that all of those mountains hold an awful lot of snow that releases throughout the season and keeps all of our waters at temperatures that are very brook trout friendly. The bad news is with all the granite that we have, there's not necessarily enough bug life in the waters in New Hampshire to get into the really, really good brook trout numbers. But um, certainly there is enough that we do get some really, really good brook trout. Um, while the focus of most of this presentation is on brook trout, of course, we do have two other trout species here in the state. Uh, the first one is our brown trout. And for those of you that are here in the valley, you know about all of the large holdover brook trout that there are in the Saco River, but uh, they also hold over in the Connecticut River, the Androscoggin River, and the Pemigewasset River. So uh, brown trout can be some of our larger trout, um, there are fish to 30 inches. There have been 30 inch brown trout caught in the Saco River. And, uh, you know, that's a huge trout. That's a trout that's going to be pushing eight to 10 pounds. That's a big, big fish. And of course, the reason brown trout can get so big is uh, they love to eat little fish and they get all the nutrients from their little fish that allow them to grow and be, uh, be one of our larger species. Our other trout is the rainbow trout. And of course, those are stocked by the state as well. Uh, in our larger rivers like the Connecticut, the Androscoggin and the Pemigewasset, there are now some wild reproduction going on with the rainbow trout. I mean, the rainbow trout are not native to New England. They're a Western trout, but uh, they have found some watersheds in the state that the water chemistry is um, acceptable to them. And um, in the Androscoggin particularly, they get super, super big. I've had customers bring me in pictures. Uh, in fact, one of the pictures was an eight pound rainbow trout that was caught in the Androscoggin. So those fish can get super huge as well. But uh, back to the brook trout. The brook trout is our state freshwater fish. Um, that they are also stocked by the state throughout uh, throughout New Hampshire, but we also have wild reproducing populations throughout the state as well. It's not a white mountains and north type of thing. There are actually wild brook trout down on the seacoast, out in the Monadnock region. There's even one of the most prolific wild brook trout streams is right in downtown Manchester. So um, our water chemistry for the most part is 
excellent for brook trout and the brook trout that are in our um, lakes and ponds have the opportunity to get up to five pounds. The state is broken up into, you know, four geographical regions for our brook trout. The Great North Woods is the majority of Coas County. And um, sorry about that. Um, the White Mountains, where we are, is a real stronghold for brook trout. In fact, the Forest Service has called the White Mountains the last bastion in our climate change era of uh, places where brook trout are going to be able to survive. Um, any of the water above 2,500 feet based on temperature monitoring done by the Forest Service uh, stays in that 52 degree range, which is prime temperature for brook trout. So um, if the climate change continues the way it's going, you know, we are gonna be the anchor for the preservation of, of wild brook trout. Your upper valley is over in the uh, Lebanon Hanover area. And there are all kinds of remote trout ponds over in the upper valley that hope that grow some very, very large brook trout. And then of course I did mention the Monadnock region. Um, as part of New Hampshire's wild trout management program, I believe almost half of the streams that are in the wild trout program are actually in the Monadnock region. So um, again, we're blessed to have excellent water conditions for brook trout. And um, you know, you can pretty much find them anywhere in the state if you're willing to look for them. Uh, I've mentioned all the ma major river drainages, the Androscoggin starts up in Errol and flows down through Maine, uh, the Amanusik starts up on the western side of the White Mountains and flows down into the Connecticut. Of course, the Connecticut starts up in Pittsburgh at Fourth Connecticut Lake and runs, I forget, I forget what the mileage is now, 600 miles and dumps into Long Island Sound. Uh, the Pemajawasset starts up in the Pemajawasset Wilderness and at Profile Lake, and that drains down into the Merrimack and then uh, the Saco River, our Saco River, which is the longest undammed river in the state of New Hampshire at 41 miles with no dams blocking the flow. The dams in the Saco don't start until the Saco gets into Maine. So how do we get to secret waters? Everybody kind of chuckles a little bit. Um, you know, the, in this day of the internet, Google Maps, social media, there's very, very few secrets. But um, Arcadia Publishing, about 10 years ago, published a book called Idaho Secret Waters, and it was one of their best-selling fishing books ever. And so they decided to do a series of books where each they're going to try and publish um, a book of secret waters in every single state. And of course, you know, states down south, it'll be more bass waters um, or warm water species but we're blessed to have the brook trout and the cold water species. And uh, one day the phone rang at the shop and I picked it up and they said, we're looking for someone that would write a book about, about the secret waters of New Hampshire. Do you know anybody? And I said, yes, I do. And uh, that was my start as an author um, writing the secret waters of New Hampshire. Uh, what equipment? do we recommend um, to fish for these wild brook trout? And, you know, you've got the wide gamut of areas that you can find these trout. You've got the small uh, headwater streams. And in those streams, we like to fish either three weights or two weight rods. Um, your all purpose weights that will work anywhere in the state on any water are your four weights or five weights. But if you want to really chase big brook trout and get deep into the ponds where those big brook trout lie, you want to be fishing with six weight and seven weights um, rods. We recommend that you have three lines. Now, three lines doesn't mean you need three reels. 
most lines come with spare spool options. And so um, you can get your floating line, your sink tip line and your full sink line all on the same reel. Um, you know, I carry my spare spools in my pouch on my float tube and, uh, you know, have the one line on my rod, depending on what my uh, plan of attack is for the pond that I'm going into. And then the other thing that's indispensable if you're going to chase after these large brook trout is a float tube because the ponds that hold these big trout, they're pretty remote. And a lot of them you're gonna to have to do some hiking into. You can drive close to some of them, but I can't think of any that don't uh, encumber some kind of walk and a float tube is the best way to get in there to get at those fish. What flies do I recommend? Well, there's specific fly patterns in the book, um, but I'm a big classic wet fly guy. If I'm gonna hike into a pond and uh, chase wild brook trout, I wanna do it with big, colorful, classic wet flies. Um, certain times of year, when the big fish are up closer to the surface, I'll fish streamer patterns. And again, I prefer the classic streamer patterns. Um, dry flies, there are a wide variety of hatches in all of these ponds. And if you can get one where you don't have to really hike too far in and can stay until nightfall, there's some excellent, excellent dry fly fishing in these ponds. And then um, in our rivers and streams, I fish a lot of nymphs because your nymphs will get you down deep in the, in the water column in the river and you're able to pick up fish in that way. So for the classic wet flies, as I said, I really love them because they're big, they're beautiful, they're colorful. This happens to be a silver doctor and um, with the married wings, the green, the yellow and the red, you know, a jungle cock eye, that blue dyed teal throat, I mean, that fly is as beautiful as the brook trout. And when the two come together, I just, I just can't think of anything that's, that's more beautiful on the planet. Except for my wife, she just reminded me, except for my wife. Classic streamers. Uh, this is a dark Edson tiger. Um, I'm a big fan of the light and dark Edson tiger. And uh, for those of you that may not know, when the Edson Tigers were first tied, um, they were tied with a metal cheek, an actual punched metal cheek. Uh, those are no longer available. So um, I use a, uh, a plasticized um, ribbon and uh, shape my own imitation metal cheeks. And you wouldn't think that it may, would make a difference one way or the other. But on these particular patterns, if you can get that flash from the metal cheeks, it makes a big, big difference. Um, our dry flies, again, these are wild brook trout. They're not particularly picky. So I like to use, uh, you know, really bushy flies. These flies here are all known as bivisibles. And the reason they're called bivisible is that you'll use a bug color. You know, if you took at that top left hand corner, that's black. Uh, underneath that is blue dun. Uh, across from that one is, is a yellow grizzly. And up above that is a bronze grizzly. But then in front of them, you tie a lighter color. And um, I know uh, Carl Files here tonight, and uh, he was at our fly tying on Monday evenings. And Carl will be tying some of these by visibles at one of the uh, bugs and brews because they're simple to tie, they're easy to tie, they, they're high floating and you can do them in a variety of sizes and colors. And, uh, you know, catching little wild brook trout on, on the surface is just a blast. And then our nymphs for fishing the brooks uh, to get down, this is a series of nymphs I did with colored rubber bands and, uh, and rubber legs. And for those of you that do tie your own flies, there's a, there's a million nymph patterns out there, but you can tie the tied and true stuff like a pheasant tail or a hare's ear. 
And uh, the only recommendation I would make is to add the rubber legs. The rubber legs seem to make a big difference because when the trout go to mouth the fly, the rubber, the rubber makes it feel like a more natural, uh, natural bug. So as I said, ponds, they're your best opportunity for large wild brook trout. And there are 50 some odd ponds that the state of New Hampshire aerial stocks. And uh, it's kind of a joke amongst those of us that chase these big wild brook trout. We call the aerial stocking, the fish and game uh, feeding program, because when those fish hit the water, the big trout go in a feeding frenzy. And uh, there aren't very many of those fry that actually survive past the first week that they get dropped in these ponds that have the wild brook trout. You wanna hike in with your float tube. I've kind of covered that. Um, we're lucky here in the White Mountains because the majority of the remote ponds that we have here in the White Mountains have named and cleared trails. You don't need to do a lot of bushwhacking. Right here, I'm getting ready to head into Big Sawyer Pond. And um, sorry, hit the button too soon. You know, Big Sawyer is one of our really nice wild remote brook trout ponds and uh you know it's only a mile and a half in it is a mile and a half straight uphill but it is only a mile and a half in and so it's very doable for a for a day um a day trip this trout here is a nice wild 14 plus inch brook trout it weighed over two pounds it was caught in a wild uh trout pond up in Wentworth location. And uh, if you get my book, if you read the book, uh, I call Wentworth location, pound for pound, the best wild trout town in the state of New Hampshire. There are four great ponds in that, in that township. And if you're willing to do the work to get into them, you know, you'll catch big, beautiful brook trout like this one right here. This little guy here was a surprise to me. One of the other things that I try to do with the invention of, of course, Google Maps is do some aerial searching. L open up your Google Maps, change it to the satellite view and start looking at, you will find beaver fl flowages and you will find ponds that no one knows about. However, when you do find them, uh, they're loaded with wild brook trout. I mean, this is, to me, this is a heritage strain brook trout. I haven't caught brook trout that look like this in any of the other wild ponds. And that leads me to believe that it's a fish that got trapped, you know, by the glaciers. No one's walked in and dumped a bunch of trout on top of it. And uh, it, that's just one of the jewels that you can find by, uh, by doing some exploring for these wild trout ponds. Here's another one that, uh, that looked a little bit different to me. Uh, this, pond, this fish was caught in a pond in the White Mountain National Forest, and it was actually caught in a pond that is stocked. And again, the reason I say that it's a wild fish is before I caught this fish, I was catching one stock fish after the other. And then all of a sudden I hooked up on this fish and it started towing my float tube around the pond. So I immediately knew that it was not one of the stock fish. And once I brought it in, you can look at those fins, look at those pectoral fins and they're perfectly clean. Now, while the state's doing a better job at making sure that we don't get the stubby fin trout, the wild trout still have those perfect fins. So um, just a gorgeous, gorgeous fish. And again, you'll know immediately when you hook up to a fish, whether or not it's a wild fish or a, a stock fish, because the stock fish don't give you much of a fight. This guy here was caught in uh, one of our three wild trout management ponds. Those ponds are barbless hooks only, catch and release only. 
um, and they close on Labor Day. But this particular fish in this pond was part of the hex hatch. And this pond has a fantastic hex hatch. For those of you that don't know what a hexagena is, it's a mayfly that's three or four inches long. It looks like a little butterfly. It's so big. And when those mayflies hatch, it's really the last chance for the bigger brook trout to get on a good feed before they have to go into their thermal refuges for the summer. And you can just have some epic, epic fishing if you get into a wild brook trout pond that has a hexagena hatch. So ponds are a lot of work. They're a lot of bigger fish. A lot of times there's not a lot of fish. So if you've only got a couple of hours and you want to go out and catch a bunch of wild brook trout, the streams are the way to go. Um, this stream here, I put this picture in because I know of all the good work that Tin Mountain's doing in getting large woody debris back into our streams, especially post Irene. Uh, you know, it's an unending battle to get large woody debris in the streams. But if you can find a stream that's got a lot, a large woody debris in it, you can catch a lot of brook trout in a hurry. And, uh, you know, a 10 inch fish is your trophy in these streams but 20, 30 fish days are not uncommon. And as I say that, I give you a picture of a 13 inch wild brook trout that I caught in a stream in the White Mountain National Forest. So that's not to say that you won't catch bigger fish because you will, but honestly, that right there is, is for, a, for a, one of our wild brook trout streams in the White Mountain National Forest. That right there is a trophy fish. That's a, that's a fish of a lifetime right there. Uh, we are starting to see some of that parasite in some of the wild brook trout. Um, it really just disrupts the beauty of the fish. They don't have a negative effect on the fish. They don't have a negative effect, fit, effect on the edibility of the fish. But, um, you know, they just take away from the beauty of those wild, wild brook trout. You want to find pools like this. This pool here is over six feet deep. I mean, it doesn't look that deep because the water's so clear. But trust me, if I stepped in there, I'd go right over my head. And when you find a pool like that and you fish a weighted nymph or one of the classic wet flies, uh, I think I caught 10 fish in this pool before it finally quieted down. So if you can find a big, deep pool, they're going to hold a lot of fish. One other thing, in these wild brook trout streams and ponds, even though it's not the law, I always fish barbless because I always let the fish go. So if, if you're the type of person that's just going to catch and release, I highly recommend you tie barbless flies buy barbless flies or pinch down the barbs of the hooks on the flies that you use in these wild trout waters. This little guy I caught in a hemlock forest in the sandwich wilderness, and I put it in for two reasons. One, look at the size of the fly that thing attacked. I mean, that's a size 10 mop fly and it's as big as the fish's head. So when you get into these little wild remote trout streams, where remember back at the beginning, I said we don't have a lot of food in the streams for these wild trout, they're voracious. They will attack anything, no matter how big it is, to try to fill their bellies. But um, remember the color of this fish. Again, it was caught in a hemlock forest. The, the woods were dark. The base, you can tell by the rocks there, the rocks were very dark colored. And that gave you a very dark colored brook trout. Conversely, here's the headwaters of the Swift River. Way, way up in the Kank. And all that water is running through this pink granite. And you can see how light colored that granite is. And if you are a dark colored brook trout, like the one in the previous slide, you wouldn't last very long in here because 
your camouflage is blown. Any predator would see you in a second. But what do the brook trout do? They're just like chameleons. That's the brook trout that I caught out of that previous pool. And you can see that he's almost pink like the granite. And so brook trout have the ability within, uh, I think it's 24 to 36 hours. If I took that trout and put him in a hemlock uh, brook, he would turn as black as that previous trout. So they have that ability to adapt to their surroundings so that they can stay camouflaged and protect themselves from being eaten. If you wanna do a wild trout pond and you've never done a wild trout pond, I would highly recommend hiring a guide. And, uh, you know, we have a couple of guides uh, that work out of the shop. They have the permit. You have to be permitted to fish in the White Mountain National Forest. But those guides can get you into either the remote brooks or the remote trout ponds and keep you safe. Um, you know, one slip in a brook or one, uh, you know, pop in your float tube in a remote pond and you can turn, it can, a uh, great day of fishing can turn into a nightmare in a hurry. So I would highly, highly recommend to any of you that if you are interested in a remote wild brook trout experience, that at the least you don't go alone, always bring a friend and, you know, leave your itinerary with somebody, but at best, you know, hire a guide. It's well worth the investment to uh, to make sure that you have a safe and fun trip. So um, when we get when I get a, close this out here, if I can, let's do an escape and stop sharing my screen. I'll do the self-promotion here now, Nora, if you don't mind. This is the book, Fly Fishing New Hampshire Secret Waters. And uh, you can come by the shop and pick it up if you haven't already. It's also available on our website, northcountryangler.com. Um, if you mention that you saw the presentation here with Tin Mountain, when you place your order online or come into the shop, uh, I'll give you a free trout fishing pond map for the White Mountain National Forest. So that's a little added incentive for you to get the book. Uh, if you haven't already gotten the book, if you have already gotten the book, I suspect I see, I see Carl on here. I see Tom Workman on here. If some of you have already gotten the book, when you stop by the shop, just let me know you already got the book. And uh, for sitting here and listening to me for 40 minutes, I'll give you the map anyway. All right. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. If there aren't any questions, you know, I could tie a quick fly for everybody. So, um, you know, I'm committed to give you, give you the hour. So Nora, why don't we uh, go ahead and you can fire away with any questions that came through. Sure. So I have two questions for you. And then if there are folks that that have questions and I should preface this by saying I am not <laughs> I don't um, I don't fly fish. Um, but my questions are um, for you are one. Do you have a favorite fishing location here in the whites? Um, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't ask you know so you don't have to give it away but is it so is it a stream or a pond I it's a pond I I'm a really a big pond guy and just to give you some background to that you know I used to fish a lot of rivers you know I, I told you guys my first fish with my dad was in Chimney Falls he was a big stream fisherman so we fished streams for years and years and years but eventually, 
um, as we know here in the Valley, especially, streams started to get too crowded, whether it was with too many anglers or kayakers or float tubers or whatever. And so to catch bigger fish and still have a remote experience, um, I really switched over to ponds. And, uh, you know, after, after a day at the shop, you know, putting in 12 hours at the shop and helping everybody go out and catch a fish and have the right flies or whatever, um, you know, I just enjoy taking a half mile, mile walk into the woods and, and parking in the float tube in a pond and just floating around for a couple of hours and, and decompressing. So, um, and there's a lot of ponds, like I said, that's why I'm offering that map to everybody here tonight at no charge, because there are a lot of ponds in the forest. Some are a half mile walk, some are a five mile walk. But uh, if you're looking for solitude in big fish, the ponds in the White Mountain National Forest are the way to go. That makes sense. Uh, there's a question that came in um, regarding water chemistry. So you had mentioned um, water chemistry. And when you say that, are you referring to the pH, to the, you know, to the dissolved oxygen? Um, Sort of what um, parameters are you? Well, let me let me do, let me give you like like let me do two answers to that. So in sure. our stream in our streams, which run through granite, believe it or not, the granite releases a lot of aluminum, and aluminum isn't isn't good for uh, bug life. So that's why we need large woody debris in our streams. The wood actually gives the right chemistry for bugs to grow. So if you've got a stream that's just got gran granite in it, there's just nothing, there's not enough nutrients for the bugs, but the decomposing large woody debris that's in the stream does give you enough nutrients for bug growth. So um, in streams, it's a, it's a problem with the granite. In ponds, it's a problem with acid rain. And we have a great pond called Mountain Pond, you know, up in Chatham. And we can't figure out what's happened to the trout there. And fish and game has stocked 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 fry in Mountain Pond, and there are still no trout. So that just tells me that we got a water quality issue. And most of the water quality issues from the Adirondacks all the way into Maine are related to acid rain. So um, we're trying to get Fish and Game to do some water quality or DES to do some water quality studies in that pond to find out if that is the issue. But um, that's, that's the water chemistry issue in ponds is mostly rel related to acid rain. Gotcha. Um, so this is, so this question I have, this is my like, which will uh, show how I, how I'm not, uh, I do not fish, but um, when is the best time of year to be, you know, to be out on the water? So the best time is from Memorial Day to 4th of July. And the, there's two reasons that that's the best time. One is that's when we get the progression of, of insect life hatches mm -hmm. that continue to, to change and release and reproduce and, and all of that. The bulk of that happens between Memorial Day and the 4th of July. Um, and of course, the other reason that the fishing is great between those time periods is that's when the maximum amount of hatchery fish are placed in our waters. So you, you've, got, you've got the two, the two prime things there, excellent bug life and plenty of fish. Gotcha. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you for entertaining my... Sure. <laughs> Why, um, does anyone else uh, tuning in have any questions for Steve? All right. Um, so, Steve, I don't know if you want to, if you have time to um, 
it's it's up to it's up to everybody if they, if they want to see me you know crank out a quick white mountain national forest muddler i can if everybody wants to just kind of decompress and absorb what they've seen you know i'm good with that too i'll do i'll do what i'll do what the crowd wants all right well those watching let us you know do let us know what would you um if folks are are interested in that we can certainly um and do it otherwise um we're also happy to you know um, yeah, and if anybody has any like specific questions or whatever, they can always come into the shop. We're open, uh, you know, six days a week. We're open every day except Tuesday. And, uh, you know, always feel free to come in and ask your question or talk shop or, or whatever. So, you know, don't feel like this is the only time that your only chance to, to learn or pick my brain, although it doesn't take long to pick my brain, but, um, you know, always feel free to come by the shop. All right. And did you say, um, is the bugs and Bruce, is that, um, is that a weekly monthly as what's the regularity on that? If folks are so, interested bu in so bugs and Bruce is our in-person fly tying. We have it at ledge brewing. It's Monday nights, five 30 till however long everybody wants to stay. Um, it's going to end at the end of March. We just did it as a trial this year to see if people liked it and they do like it. Um, so, you know, we'll be doing it again next year. So we'll start it a little bit earlier, but uh, yeah, there's three more, I think three more. I'm losing track of time now. I think there's three more Mondays left in March. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and you don't have to tie. If you just want to come over and watch us, and talk shop and have a beer <laughs> that's acceptable and too. support yes it's you know supporting one of one of uh tin mountains you know staff as well um associated with that but yeah so if folks are you know if you are in the area um and you know on a or, you know want to head up to intervale um that's a, that sounds like a great option you yeah and if, and if you're not if you're not close enough to be able to come in person on Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock, I do virtual liars and tires uh, on Facebook. So you can also, you know, uh, you know, internet yourself into a, a free fly tying lesson as well on Saturday mornings. And also, as, as far as that goes, that liars and tires that I do Saturday morning, I do post that on my Facebook page. So if you aren't available Saturday mornings, you can watch it at any time. Every they're all there from November when we started that. So um, we've had fun this uh, this winter tying all different kinds of of patterns, and you know you can go back and and check that out, and uh, you know watch what we've been doing in liars and tires all winter long. Hey Steve. Yeah. Did you say you needed a special permit to fish in the national forest? Guides need a permit to guide you. Oh, okay. Yeah, you don't need one if you're going to do it on your own, but okay. um, guiding for anything in the forest, mountain climbing, ice climbing, fishing, hiking, anything has to be permitted by the National Forest. Okay, and when will they start stocking this year? Do you know? Um, I know that they finished the stocking chart, um, but if history, if history is a, is a, what do they say a track record of future performance uh they're going to do the ponds first they'll start stocking the ponds in april so that on opening day april 23rd the ponds all have fish in them and then it becomes a temperature thing and it looks like we didn't get a huge amount of snowpack this year so my guess this is only my guess is that they'll start stocking the rivers in early May, right after they get all the ponds done. Yeah, they, don't they usually start in the southern part of the state first? Correct, because the southern part, ice goes out on the ponds and the rivers warm up to 50 degrees down south first. They like, they like, to, they like the water to be close to 50 so that when they dump the hatchery trout in, they don't go into shock. <laughs> <laughs> 
But back. yeah, you can go back. You can go back. Fishing game posts the past year's stocking, and within a week's time, they'll they're always the same. So you can go back to Fishing Game's website, look at the 2021 stocking, and you'll have a rough idea within a week or so when they're going to stock. All right, wonderful. Are there any other questions for Steve? I just wanted to say great job, Steve, and thanks for doing this for us. Appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate you guys coming out tonight to listen to me. And, uh, you know, I've missed all you guys that used to come in person to Liars and Tires. Yeah. It looks like the pandemic might finally be waning and we can get back to fly tying in person at the shop yep. next, next fall. Let's hope so. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. All righty, guys, thanks so much. Okay. And uh, don't okay. forget, free pond fishing map if you get the book. Okay. <laughs> hey. All, right, All righty, everybody. Have Bye. a great night. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Bye.